micro nano education for everyone. Thank you. All right. So um, let me intro introduce ev everyone to um, Dr. Nathan Jackson. Um, he's going to be presenting today on his his story of be, being a MEMS engineer. I'm going to ask you all to keep your mics mics muted during the presentation. This is will be recorded and put on YouTube so you can watch it later. If you do have questions, feel free to put it in the chat box. And then at the appropriate time, um, we'll go ahead and and ask those questions to Nathan so he can respond. All right, so please keep your mics muted throughout the presentation. And as I said, you feel free to um, put any questions you have in the chat box and either Billy or I will respond immediately to those or we'll wait for the appropriate time to ask Dr. Jackson. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and let um, Nathan start his presentation. Billy, if you could give him I rights. Think I, I think I have it. Yeah. Okay. And then um, I'll mute myself as well. And you can just get started, Nathan, as, as you feel like it. Great. Uh, so first, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for letting me come and give you this talk. Um, so yeah, so my name is Nathan Jackson. I'm an assistant professor at uh, University of New Mexico in mechanical engineering. Uh, so first, you know, my talk, actually, I should have titled it My Journey, because everyone has their own journey. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is not necessarily what's true for everyone. Um, but I just might the highlight that I want to talk about is really that, you know, you never know what your career is going to take you and what path you you're, you take. And you'll see that throughout my talk, you know, I started in one area, and I ended up now I'm working in something completely different than where I started. And, you know, so always try to learn, you know, and get the most experience and skills, um, you know, in what you're doing, because you never know when you're going to need that even stuff like that I'll talk about today, you'll see that, you know, stuff I did like 15 years ago. Now I'm like, I haven't used it in like 15 years. But all of a sudden now in my research, I'm like, Oh, wait, maybe I can use that to solve this problem. So you know, I'm always trying to solve problems based on the skills and stuff that I've learned in my past experience. Um, so yeah, just to give a brief background on myself before I get into my talk too much. So I got my PhD in from Arizona State and in bioengineering. So actually, all of my degrees are bioengineering, but now I'm in mechanical engineering. Um, in the past, I also did a postdoc in material science, and and then a and then you know I was a senior researcher in microelectronics. So you know I've been been kind of in all the different engineering disciplines. Um, except for nuclear, really, is the only one I haven't really touched on too much. Uh, but my work was on uh, brain machine interfaces, which I'll briefly talk about uh, a little bit later. And then after I graduated, uh, I went on to work in a microelectronics uh, national institute in Ireland. Uh, so it's a third leading, uh, third largest microelectronics institute in Europe. Um, and it's the only uh, national lab in, in Ireland. And there, I, you know, I first started off as a postdoc and then became a, uh, a senior researcher. And then I became a MEMS, uh, the MEMS team leader before, uh, before leaving. So I worked there for about eight years and then I joined uh, UNM. I decided to go back into academia, uh, come back as an assistant professor at UNM in 2017. So I've been working in the area of MEMS for over 18 years now. Uh, and I've worked everything from design to fabrication, uh, MEMS packaging, characterization, and everything from academic to industry. Uh, so, you know, so some so fundamental science to stuff that's actually being, that's already commercialized. Uh, so I've worked a lot with different companies, you know, as is shown here, analog devices, Intel, Philips, Aerogen, Soren, uh, you know, a lot of medical companies, some semiconducting companies all, all over the place. Uh, my research is really focused on uh, smart materials, um, and how to how to integrate these materials into MEMS devices, and then also making these into uh, applications. So I, I, I'm very much an applied uh, researcher, so I try to make things that are going to be useful in the near future. So I work a lot with energy harvesters, um, aerosol generators or atomizers, acoustic resonators, which are sort of the big area for, for a lot of MEMS devices right now. 
And I do occasionally go back to my route, my, my, my foundations in bioengineering and do some biomedical stuff. Although that's sort of limited uh, right now. Um, so the outline of my talk, you know, uh, first, I know some of you have heard some of the other seminars and stuff, but I'll just go through a brief background of what MEMS are and some of the jobs that are available, some of the market analysis, uh, you know, why you might be interested in a, a job and a career in this area. And then, you know, talk about how multidisciplinary, uh, you know, this uh, MEMS area is. And then my, the heart of my talk, though, is going to be on my, my journey. So where I started in MEMS, I'll go through some of the research applications that we did. And then, you know, what I'm working on now in the last, you know, 10 years or so. Um, and, and that's sort of going to be the, the basis of my talk. So I'll try to give a high level overview of most of the talk, uh, of most of the, the areas that I'm working on. Um, so the first thing is, so what are, what is MEMS devices or what are they? So MEMS stands for micro electro mechanical systems. Um, al alternative names are actually micro systems or micro machines. These are again, the same thing. I actually prefer the term micro systems over, over uh, micro electro mechanical systems because not all MEMS devices have electro or mechanical components, uh, but they usually are again, all on the micro scale. So these are all small scale devices. So this is actually uh, images taken from Sandia. Um, you know, they were one of the big sort of people working in the MEMS area. So these are some gears and these are all at the micro scale. So these are things are uh, the fabrication processes. These are all stuff that's smaller than, uh, you know, than human hair. Human hair is about 100 microns in diameter. Um, some of these fabrications, some of these components are, you know, again, one, two microns uh, in length or in dimensions. So therefore, you know, again, uh, if you were to cut a human hair into about 100 different pieces, uh, you know, that's about the sizes of a lot of these things that we're working with. So your first question might be, uh, why are we interested in MEMS? So MEMS, you know, one, one reason is because they are smaller. Um, so you can fit more things in a smaller space. Um, they are usually lower cost, and that's because we do batch fabrication. So like these are, so the fabrication process is similar to like how Intel and stuff make their transistors. So we make lots of devices at once. Also, um, when we're talking, a lot of these devices are sensors. Um, and some of the sensors, you know, again, uh, when we go to small scale, we can make them more sensitive. So therefore we can detect, you know, smaller amounts of, uh, you know, whatever we're trying to sense, such as, you know, for instance, biomedical, you know, you might be, people have made sensors that can detect down to a single virus, you know, uh, so single molecules. And then, you know, also when we get to the small scale, these are usually have lower power requirements. So then we don't need as much power to power these things. Um, they also operate at faster response time. So th think of an airbag. So uh, one of the earliest MEMS devices is an airbag deployment. And, and again, you want these to operate very quickly. So as soon as it detects, you know, a crash coming, it, it deploys very fast. So you want these things to operate very fast. And even for your phones, you know, uh, MEMS devices in your phones need to operate at high frequencies, you know, in the gigahertz range. Um, and really the other reason with MEMS is that it's, we're able to integrate this with microelectronics. So it's, a lot of times we try to make them compatible with how they make uh, transistors. So that way we can integrate them and, you know, have everything all in one. And there's other, there's a lot of other numerous advantages depending on the applications and different devices as well. So, uh, so where are MEMS used? So the first big boom uh, of MEMS was really in the automotive industry. So in the nineties, and it still be, it still is a very popular area. There's still a lot of MEMS, you know, sensors and components in, in automotive. And actually this is still increasing. I mean, if anyone's bought a car recently, you know, they have lane detection, they have all, you know, there's so many different sensors, uh, you know, to try to make it more safe. Uh, and less likely to get an accident, but also they're adding, you know, such as tire pressure sensors, you know, um, stuff for your engine. So, you know, that was, but these were popular back in the nineties and still uh, continue to increase as well. The next big boom uh, was cons consumer electronics and the, your phone. Um, so your phones are the main one that's been the main target over the last 15 years. Uh, you know, every, most people have a smartphone now and, you know, 
if you bought anyone recently compared to the ones, you know, back in 2007, 2008, when they first came about, you know, again, the functionality and the, the amount that they can do is increased uh, quite dramatically. And this is what's drive, driven a lot of MEMS devices. Your, your phone right now has, you know, quite a few different MEMS sensors and, and actuators uh, to make it work. And actually the MEMS device, uh, the duplexer, um, which is a, you know, an RF MEMS device that was re really kicked off the, the development of MEMS uh, duplexers has really kicked off the area of smartphones. So what's going to be the next big boom? The next big boom is really going to be in the area of the Internet of Things, uh, which is currently ongoing. Um, so we want, you know, we want information. We live in a time where we want information and everything. You know, we want we want smart buildings. You know, we, you know, we're talking about like, you know, when you enter in the, in a room, you want, you know, okay, the air condition to come on, or you want, you know, a certain, you know, changing, even essentially changing the wallpaper, changing the color, changing the lights, you know, uh, to detect who's coming in and everything else. So, you know, we want smart buildings. We want to be able to detect, you know, um, gas, you know, carbon dioxide, if there's a leak, you know, uh, carbon monoxide, you know, all, all these things we want to be able to sense, you know, and not only in smart buildings, but we're talking about agriculture, we're talking about roads, uh, structural health monitoring, we want all these things. And in order to do this, we need, you know, um, we need MEMS devices to act as the sensors, also the communication systems, and potential and also the batteries and, and energy harvesting, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So the MEMS market um, so is, is quite growing. So if you're interested in a potential career in this area, you know, I'd recommend it. You know, the growth is about 11 to 13 percent annually right now uh, compared to ICs, which is about 7 percent. And in the future, you know, people are predicting that this will grow about 15 to 30 percent annually over the next 10 years. And this is a bunch of different areas. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, uh, but you can see the areas that are gaining a lot of um, interest. And for instance, this bottom one, uh, this is uh, BA filters, which stands for bulk acoustic wave filters. And I mentioned the phone, uh, the smartphone. So this is really the, these, fil these type of filters are what's caused uh, the smartphones to come about. And you can see about 2007 when the smartphones, that's when they were you know, just starting. Uh, but over the time now that phones have become so important and everyone has one, you see the huge demand has increased quite a bit. Um, and some of these other areas are more areas or, you know, just they're starting to get into this is stuff that we've been doing research on. So I'll talk a little bit about some of my research in energy scavenging and some of these other areas, drug delivery. Uh, but these are just new areas which we're hoping will continue to increase. And this is, these would be the next big thing. Um, so MEMS, though. So MEMS is highly interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary. You don't, you can't be an expert in every single one of these, but really, you know, it requires, you know, knowledge of all working STEM uh, disciplines. You know, um, the name itself, yes, has mechanics in it and electrical. So, you know, those are two of the main components, uh, but you also need chemistry. You know, like when you're making these devices and the microfabrication, you know, you're doing photolithography, you're doing etching, you know, you're dealing with very dangerous chemicals and you need to know, you know, again, how to, how to work with these. Um, a lot of times, a lot of um, MEMS devices use heat. Uh, and I'll talk a little about these. Uh, during my PhD, I worked on electrothermal uh, actuators. Some use fluids, uh, some use magnetics, some, you know, uh, even math, you know. So a lot of the people working in the, um, like the industry, you know, design of experiments. So your statistics is extremely important to industry. Uh, so again, mathematics people are very important. And even nanotechnology or even quantum mechanics is, it can be important because the next generation, you know, we're talking about, I'm talking about micro electromechanical systems, but the next generation is really nano uh, electromechanical systems. So going to nanotechnology and down to the nano scale. So what kind of jobs are there? there? There's a lot of different jobs. You know, some of, you know, the ones I list here are some common jobs. First, you know, there's the typical jobs, which are, you know, fabrication, process engineer, technician. So these are the people in there actually working, making the devices. Um, and then there's, you know, then there's MEMS desi device designers. So these are the people maybe sitting at a computer. Uh, so these are more computational people. They would be designing the masks. 
They would be, you know, des- developing the layout, the structure of their different devices, you know. Um, and these are, again, a lot of computational people in this area. And then there's characterization or test engineers. And then there's also MEMS packaging. So a lot of people, especially in academics, don't really know too much on MEMS packaging. But packaging is really about 80% of the cost of a MEMS device uh, goes into packaging. And that's because there's no standard packaging. In ICs, there's standard packaging techniques. But in MEMS, every MEMS device is different. Uh, so it requires different packaging. So that's why it's very unique. And uh, packaging is one area that I'll briefly talk about in my, you know, because I, I worked on this during my PhD, but it's often overlooked in academia um, just because it's it's hard to get funding uh, to do men's packaging. But um, but jobs, other jobs that you might not associate with MEMS or in the, this area is uh, stuff like microfabrication equipment. So the equipment we use to make these devices, such as like deep reactive iron etching, furnaces, um, you know, uh, photolithography systems, you know, even testing equipment, all these, you know, uh, so building these equipment is, is quite important and to making devices and, and characterizing these. Another one is clean room infrastructure. So these are people that help design clean rooms and also help keep it operating. So the clean room is a complicated system. You know, you have to control the humidity, you have to control temperature, you have to control the particles. So, you know, get, keeping these systems operating, you know, is, is also quite challenging. And actually, um, a lot of times the equipment people, uh, people fixing equipment in there um, for companies will actually probably make more money than any of the engineers almost doing the fabrication process because, you know, it's so useful because if the equipment goes down, say if, at Intel, um, you know, that that's money, you know, it's, they can't process wafers if there's some equipment's down. So they need things to be up and working, you know, as soon as possible. So a lot of times you're, you might be on call 24 uh, seven, but again, you're, you're quite valuable. Uh, I know a lot of MEMS engineers who have gone on to work in sales. So selling MEMS devices or even wafers or, you know, uh, a lot of these materials. Um, so yeah, so you can work in sales. Um, quality assurance, again, very important, especially in bio MEMS area, um, trying to get things FDA approved. Robotics. So a lot of times like uh, places like Intel, um, you know, process engineers don't actually ever touch the wafers. So they need, so they have robots that, that do all this stuff. So then you need the, you know, people designing and developing these robots uh, to, to handle these wafers and to handle the processing. Uh, machine learning is becoming very popular, um, you know, and in, in potentially in the future, uh, a, a keen interest in, in MEMS area and microfabrication. And there's, like I said, there's many more uh, jobs, but this is just to give you a sort of a rough overview of some of the job potentials uh, that are out there. In short, basically, if, if yeah, I'm sorry, moving my cursor. Um, if you're work, if you if you have a discipline or knowledge in STEM, you know there, there's a job opportunity in, in MEMS. You know, um, any any STEM discipline that you're working in, uh, there's potentially a job uh, for you in MEMS. So now I'm going to talk to you uh, about sort of my journey, uh, which, like I said, should have been the title of my talk: my journey as a MEMS uh, researcher. Uh, first, before I go into my journey, I'm going to tell you where I am now, and then I'll show you, and then I'll go through sort of the history of it. So my group uh, focuses, my group's called the SMART group. So SMART Materials and MEMS for Applied Research Technology. And we really work on the three pillars in MEMS, which are materials, design, and fabrication. So with in MEMS areas, we, we do a lot with bunch of different materials. And we're always trying to develop new materials, uh, new smart functional materials. And then we have to, but then we can't just develop materials. We have to develop, how are we going to introduce them into our fabrication process and make sure they're compatible with other materials or other fabrication processes. And then once we do that, then we can worry about making devices. So in, in these three pillars, you know, we develop new materials, Designing, this has to do with uh, developing new like finite element modeling, which I won't really talk too much about in this in this talk. Uh, but, but again, it is a huge uh, area of interest and it's more computational, um, you know, uh, design. And then uh, fabrication is always an interest and we're, we're not just trying to take these materials and fabricate something, but we're also always trying to develop new fabrication techniques, new methods of making uh, new materials. And how and how to make them compatible with current uh, fabrication processing steps. 
And my research mostly focuses on piezoelectrics. So you'll see this come up quite a bit. Um, but I've also worked a lot with um, other materials, which I won't really talk about, such as magnetics, uh, hydrogels, uh, polymers, elastomers, uh, liquid metals, uh, stuff like this that we try to develop into, uh, into different devices. So this is sort of an overview of, um, of, of the current applications that my research is, is working on. So I won't, uh, you know, I'll briefly talk about some of these in this lecture, um, but just, yeah, kind of at a high level overview. Um, one of my big areas of interest is in energy harvesting. So this is kinetic energy harvesting. So at the micro scale, so we're working on trying to harvest small amounts of uh, wasted mechanical energy. So, and what I mean by this is, so there's everything around us is vibrating, you know, our buildings, um, you know, um, our desks, every, everything, or cars, everything has some type of vibration. It might be small, uh, so you can't feel it, but again, there is some vibration there. And so we want to try to harvest energy from this. Uh, and the main reason for this, which I'll talk about a little bit later, is to power like the internet of things. Um, so that way we can just get, we just need small amounts of power. I'm not talking about like large, I'm not talking about powering like the whole city or something like that, like wind turbines and stuff like that. We're just tar tar trying to harvest small amounts of energy just to power a sensor. I also do a lot of work in uh, biomedical sensors, which I won't really talk about in this lecture too much. Um, we do a lot of work with actuators. These are gas pumps, uh, drug delivery systems, microphones for your, for your phone, uh, micro speakers, uh, stuff like this. And then uh, with materials, we do a lot with trying to develop, I'm trying to develop more flexible or even go one step further into stretchable uh, electronics. So right now we're in flexible, but we hope to then eventually go to stretchable electronics. And this will not explain why we're interested in this a little bit later. I do a lot of work with acoustic resonators. So these can be anything from ultrasound uh, transducers. Uh, we work with gas sensors. Uh, these can also be particle sensors. I do, you know, this is combined kind of with medical sensing as well. Um, these are also RF MEMS devices. So like filters and stuff that filter transmissions from your phone. And yeah, and a lot of different things there. I won't I'll briefly talk about these, but not, not in too much depth. And then tactile sensors. So the, we're working on making new touchscreen, you know, devices, uh, smart gloves uh, for surgeons and, and all these kind of different uh, applications. And there's other applications that we're working on too, besides these. So that's kind of where I am and, and now. Now I'm gonna to talk to you about where I started. So my first experience in MEMS uh, started actually as a graduate student. So um, you guys are already way farther ahead than I was. Uh, when I was an undergrad, I knew nothing about MEMS. I didn't know what MEMS were. I didn't know anything. I never heard of the word MEMS. Uh, it wasn't until after I, I graduated and you know I was looking at where to do graduate work. Um, and then one, one professor, uh, from Arizona State, Dr. Mithaswamy, my former advisor, he showed me a video. You know, I was like talking to him, like, hey, you know, I was maybe interested in your research. I want to see which, what you did. And he showed me a video of a MEMS device uh, from Sandia. And from then I was, I was sold. I knew that that's what I wanted to work on. And I knew I wanted to work with him. And, you know, and that's where I started. So my, my experience um, was in, like I said, my master's and PhD was in brain machine interfaces. So we were using uh, movable MEMS implantable microelectrodes uh, that we implanted in the brain um, to be used as a brain machine interface. And I'll explain what this actually is on the next slide. So this has been an area of brain machine interfaces, uh, especially electrodes being implanted in the brain, have been an area of interest uh, by many researchers, neuroscientists, and engineers for over 50 years, since the 70s. Um, and really people are, the reason why we're interested in this is mostly for neuroprosthetics. So people that have maybe a, uh, that are paralyzed from like the neck down, um, you know, they don't have much function. They can't really do much. Uh, you know, they can, you know, they, they breathe and that's, you know, and, and they're more in a vegetative state. So we wanna to try to give them some functionality. So if we can try to 
implant electrodes and tell what they're thinking, you know, their brain is still intact, their brain works. Uh, but then, you know, if we can then use those signals to understand what they're trying to do, then we can use that control uh, like a robot, like a robotic limb um, or a wheelchair for someone who's completely paralyzed from the neck down or a computer. So uh, you can move a mouse cursor or something like that. Now, this is a very complicated process, um, and there's a lot of different engineering that is required to get this to work. My area of research uh, for my master's or PhD was in just the electrodes, so just implanting these electrodes and trying to get an electrical signal out of the brain. Um, then there's a whole other group I'd be working on signal processing, the robotics, all that kind of stuff, uh, but that's a whole other area. So we're just focused on just trying to get implant these electrodes and get this, uh, try to get some signals out of the brain. Like I mentioned, this work started uh, really in, in the MEMS area. It started in the 70s at the University of Michigan, where they were working on, uh, Kinsall Wise developed a uh, silicon-based uh, uh, electrode that he implanted. And then, you know, the work's still going on there at the University of Michigan uh, in this area. And they've advanced quite a bit from these single uh, electrodes to, you know, multi-array electrodes with integrating it with electronics and, and wireless sensors and everything else. Uh, University of Utah is also another one that was, uh, that's very big in, in this area as well. Um, some challenges, though, with these current devices, uh, and like I said, research is still going on even 50 years later. So, I mean, it's still not, we still haven't even perfected or optimized uh, these devices uh, still to this day. Um, and that's because of there's numerous challenges. There's challenges with mechanics. Um, you know, these are, for instance, these are usually silicon. Um, so silicon is a very stiff material. So implanting that in the brain, which the brain is basically like jello. It's, you know, it's, and it's constantly moving. The brain is not static. It's, it's moving inside your skull. Um, again, micro motions, you know, but small amounts of movement. But if, you know, think about this though, if you stick a fork, a metal fork into jello, you know, um, you're going to get, you know, eventually you're going to create uh, tissue damage. And that's what happens with these devices. So, um, so you create you can create tissue damage uh, or bio incompatibility. And this causes scar tissue to form around these electrodes, which is a process called gliosis. And when these scar tissues form, this acts as a big, like a big uh, uh, resistor or impedance on these. And when you're trying to get microvolts, uh, you know, signals out, basically it causes your whole system to fail. You won't get any signals out of your device. So what we came up with, along with other people, so MIT and Caltech were sort of the first people to look at this. They came up with movable electrodes. So once this gliosis forms, can we move the can we move the electrode through the gliosis, and then and then we're able to record for longer periods of times? Because right now a lot of these things might fail in a couple of weeks, and that's why you know they're still not really used in humans yet. That still is sort of in animal uh, stages. Uh, so they tried to come up with these movable ones, but they, the way they had these movable ones is they use big actuators. So these things, I think the size of this, yeah, I mean, you can see 10, mil, 10 millimeters. So, you know, you can figure out, you know, these things are a couple inches in hot height. Um, and same thing, you know, you see it on the mouse here, which if you were to scale this up to a human, you know, again, you can imagine, okay, you know, you have this huge chamber sitting on your head. Well, that's not very practical, is it? Um, so what we came up with is, can we make a movable MEMS device? So make this much smaller um, and then, you know, adds more practicality. So we partnered with Sandia National Labs uh, using the Summit 5 process to create these uh, movable electrodes. So this is one of our chips. So this is, uh, the, this is about three millimeters in, wide. So each one of these electrodes, which you see here, um, is about, I think it's about 50 microns. So it's about half of the, the size of a diameter of a human hair. And um, so these are polysilicon electrodes, which come, come off the chip. You can't quite see it because I used the black horrible. You know, I shouldn't have used the black background. I should have used the white or something. Uh, but the edge is right where I have my laser pointer here is where electrodes are coming off the chip. And then we'd implant it into the brain of, uh, of an animal. Now we used, uh, we used electrothermal actuators to cause these things to move. So how these work, so if you apply electrical, um, you know, uh, 
if you apply a potential electrical potential to some to some conducting material such as polysilicon, what happens? Um, so you apply current through it, it's going to heat up. And what happens when things when a material heats up? It expands. So if you design these to expand in a certain way. Uh, for instance, this one, so we, we cause it to, so we're applying a voltage here and it's heating up and expands. What happens is it can grab a hold. We have little uh, teeth sort of on the, on these electrodes. So it comes up, grabs a hold of the next part. And then when we release the voltage, we uh, reduce the temp, the heating and it, and it pulls it down. And this happens very quickly since remember uh, I said at the MEM scale things happen it's fast response so heat transfer in these devices is very quick um, so it takes you know milliseconds um, to, to 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 transfer these uh, let me see if I can get the video okay so here's a video of a device, one of our device working so here's the probe eventually so you see this kind of shine. A little bit here so the shining is the heat going through it so it's heating and it's moving and then you see this actually if you pay close attention you can see it move it's moving in eight micron steps um if i ran this movie uh or you know this video long enough eventually you would see it come off the edge of the chip and you know but we can move in very small uh increments Let's see let me and, and sure enough, we demonstrate that this works. So we were, you know, at one point we got no signals uh, from, from our brain. Uh, then we would move it. Um, this is moved. And then like 10 seconds later after moving it, um, you know, to a new location, we were able to pick up signals. So we were able to increase the longevity of our device from two weeks uh, of getting signals to over six months. Um, and this is, and that's what led to me getting my PhD. Another work that I did during my PhD uh, was in the area of packaging. So um, I worked worked a lot with men's packaging. Um, yeah, and, and this is you know sort of what led me to my next step in my career uh, in, working in the National Institute um, from my work in packaging. I'm not going to go through the packaging too much, but again, I already said uh, men's packaging is a extremely important uh, you know area. And again, just showing how we can get down to smaller scale uh, packaging. Uh, to have flexible packaging as well. Um, yeah, this is sort of the only thing I wanted to say on this slide. So this was a side project I had for my PhD where we were using ultrasound uh, to stimulate neurons. We wanted to see if uh, basically if the imaging uh, ultrasound could actually stimulate uh, fetal neurons. And we demonstrated this. Um, we were one of the first people to work on ultrasound stimulation. And th this is what sparked my initial interest in piezoelectrics um, because we we're using piezoelectrics for to create the ultrasound transducer. Uh, but my role was more on the the micro the, the neurons. So this is a way that we basically took neurons instead of putting it in the brain, we took neurons from the brain and put it on these devices to look at how individual neurons uh, worked. So now I'm going to talk to you about uh, my area and my research area of piezo mims. So like I said, every story has a beginning. Um, so everyone always says like, well, how did I go from working in, in, in the area of bioengineering to, to, to the area where I can say smartphones and stuff like that? Well, you know, when I, when, after I got my PhD, I worked, I, I got hired on in, to work at Tyndall National Institute. And our project was on developing an implantable wireless sensing system uh, to monitor uh, physiological parameters uh, such as restinosis. So restinosis is where um, you have basically, uh, if you if you want to implant a stent because you you have a clogged artery, um, restinosis is the reclogging of that artery. So if you have a stent in place, you have reclogging of the artery. And we wanted, and if this reclogs, then you know then you have major issues. So we wanted to try to detect this restinosis so that way you can go see the doctor if you need a new stent put in. Um, to do this, we had we we needed a sensor, which we developed a sensor that was not not too difficult. Uh, we developed we had to communicate, so we had to communicate outside of the body. We had to develop the electronics to transmit this, um, and then we had to develop a new stretchable packaging or interconnect. And that's what that was my that was my job. But we were able to do this. We were able to to accomplish all these. The one thing that we had a challenge with is power. How are we going to power this device? It's implanted in the body. How are we going to power this? 
we eventually came up with the idea of using piezoelectric. So we could have a piezoelectric material like hanging in the blood flow. And as the blood passes, it's going to cause this to bend and we could harvest energy from that. Now we never actually got to around to implementing it, just did some modeling and stuff like that with it. But this was what sparked our interest in energy harvesting and piezoelectrics. And eventually we got the interest of companies such as analog devices who was like, okay, you know, they weren't interested in really the biomedical aspect of it, but they were interested in the energy harvesting aspect. And okay, can you use this to, to power other, uh, uh, other applications? So the first part now of my talk, uh, my, uh, my talk is really, uh, my research is going to be on the piezoelectric materials. So I'll just briefly go through this really quick. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on piezoelectrics, uh, but piezoelectrics, they've been around for quite a while. There's still a lot of research going on in this area. Um, but the main reason why we're, I'm interested in this is because they have two different, uh, they have a direct effect and a converse effect. So piezoelectrics, basically, if you put, if you apply a force or if you stretch it, you can get a voltage readout. So in this way, it's very good as a sensor. You know, if you put a particle on these, uh, you will get a voltage change. So you will get, you know, so it's very good as a mass loading sensor, for instance. On the other hand, it's also good as an actuator because if you apply a voltage to, or, to this, you're, you can cause it to either stretch or compress. So it can. So in this way, it's very good for MEMS because it can act as a sensor or an actuator. Another reason why I'm interested in piezoelectrics is it's really a, a lot of people are saying it's the next big thing for MEMS devices. Um, so, you know, in a lot of it, the interest has started, like I said, with the bulk acoustic wave filters used in your phones um, and also inkjet printers. This is what started the, the, the area of piezo MEMS. But now there's a lot of people looking at piezo MEMS in the future. It looks very bright. You know, people are looking at it for your microphones, for your, you know, for your phones, uh, speakers, uh, fingerprint uh, technology, gesture recognition. So there's a lot of different areas. And so this is one of the reasons why I'm interested in piezo MEMS. Um, so the first, though, like I said, the first fundamental to piezo MEMS is creating the material. So we work on a lot of different materials and because uh, each piezo, there's so many piezoelectric materials um, and each one has their own advantages and disadvantages and are good for certain applications and, and bad for other applications. But we're working on not only in developing these materials, but also enhancing the properties and even going one step further and trying to create new piezoelectric materials um, and mostly focusing on ones that are compatible with microfabrication so we can use them in MEMS. So we deal with some ceramic materials like aluminum nitride, zinc oxide, uh, PZT, stuff like this. Uh, but we also deal with polymer piezoelectrics like PVDF and trying to add nanocomposites to these to make them uh, more compatible. And then we work with um, trying to create new piezoelectric materials, new polymer or stretchable uh, piezoelectric materials. Um, one of my big areas of interest uh, over the years has been on, like I said, developing flexible uh, piezoelectric materials. So I worked with aluminum nitride, which is a uh, compatible with uh, current fabrication process. And that's actually one of the main materials used in your phone uh, for a lot of the sensors. Uh, but yet it's, it's a stiff material. It's, it's, it has a Young's modulus of about 350 gigapascal. So it's very stiff. Uh, but we were, I was interested in trying to make it flexible. So I developed, you know, back about eight years ago, I developed a process for making it flexible by depositing it onto a flexible substrate. Um, the quality of the material wasn't as good. So this, so D33 is sort of how we determine the, the quality of the material. So it wasn't quite as good as we can get when we deposit onto a single crystal silicon, about four times less. Uh, so we weren't satisfied, but it was still better than anyone done at the time. Uh, but then I developed new methods of depositing onto different polymers, more crystalline polymers, and trying to alter the material properties of these polymers to, in, to promote uh, the aluminum nitride growth uh, to enhance the properties. And we were able to get much better, you know, uh, quality aluminum nitride. And now these can be used and, and they're quite often used uh, and cited in a lot of different academics and commercial applications now where people are using this type of uh, polymer um, piezoelectric materials. Um, so my group, like I said, we focus on creating flexible and stretchable piezoelectrics through different techniques, such as modifying the polymer uh, materials, 
um, the crystal structures. We try to add composite materials, adding nanocomposites to these. And we also can create a kind of hybrid uh, piezoelectric materials as well. Um, other materials that I work with other than piezoelectrics are stretchable materials. So I try to develop uh, new stretchable elastomers and trying to introduce, integrate them with uh, liquid metal such as uh, gallon stand. Uh, so we were using these for tunable uh, MEMS devices. So uh, these were introduced as tunable antennas. So that way we could actually tune the antenna. Um, so if you want to transmit at a certain frequency and then you want to change and transmit at a different frequency, you don't need multiple antennas. You can actually use just one antenna and change the, 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 the frequency at which you tune in. Um, I've also worked with smart hydrogels and kind of, you know, I see my time, so I'm actually going to probably skip this area for now. Uh, but yeah, these were smart hydrogels, uh, basically the opposite of a stent. Um, so now I'm going to talk to you about some devices that we work on. So one is uh, energy harvesting. Um, so I've already, kind of already answered these initial questions. So the initial question is, why are we interested in MEMS energy harvesting? I've briefly talked about that. The answer is the Internet of Things. Like I said, we want information on everything. Um, so what are these Internet of Things? What is it? It's a wireless sensor network. Um, so all these Internet of Things have sensors. They all have a microcontroller, a transceiver. Uh, but more importantly, they all have, they all require some type of power. Um, well, right now, these power come from a battery. Um, so all, all these things are powered by a battery, but batteries, as you know, need to be replaced. And sometimes these, you know, when, you know, when you're talking about a couple of devices in your house or something, that's fine. But when you're talking about having trillions of devices around the world, that's a lot of batteries. Now the battery industry would probably love this, uh, but ultimately it can cost quite a bit to change the batteries. Uh, for instance, if it's in a remote area, such as like on the Golden Gate Bridge or something like that, um, if it's at the top of that, you know, again, paying someone to go up there just to change a battery can be quite uh, labor intensive. So we want to create a self-sustaining system that can, uh, that can harvest energy uh, from the ambient environment, uh, such as through vibrations. Uh, which is shown here. There's there's multiple energy harvesting techniques. There's photovoltaics, solar cell, uh, thermoelectrics. Uh, but again, we're interested in movable, uh, so vibrational or kinetic energy harvesters. And even in kinetic energy harvesters, there's multiple ones. But we're targeting piezoelectrics. Um, and the applications that we're targeting are mostly in the area of structural health monitoring, uh, automotive, military applications. Uh, such as drones, uh, industrial use, uh, healthcare, um, but you know, again, it, it's smart buildings, stuff like this is what we're sort of targeting. So initially, when we started working on this, this is about 10 years ago that I worked on this, you know, first we had to develop the piezoelectric material, okay, we did that. Then we had to develop the, how to integrate it into the device, and we had to optimize the device. So in the couple, first couple of years of our research, we, we, we weren't targeting a specific application. We were just trying to get the highest power density that we could. And we showed that we were able to get up there with the best uh, power densities, you know, up to about 2.5 milliwatts uh, per centimeter cubed, which is pretty, pretty good. But one thing, this is in an, this is in an ideal lab setting. Uh, once you go to actually applying this in a real life application, your power, your, your, your values are gonna drop quite a bit be just because of there's, you know, there's unknowns, there's, you know, there's uncertainties um, that have to happen in real life applications. So there's four major challenges associated with MEMS vibrational energy harvesting. One is low power density. Um, you, you need, you always want to, you always want to harvest more energy so that way you can power more, more systems. Uh, so that's always one problem. The other problem is bandwidth. So these devices have a very narrow bandwidth of about one hertz. So that means, what that means is that if you have, if this is your, your, your resonant frequency of your device, but then all of a sudden your frequency of your source, your vibration is over here is saying highlighted in blue, you can see our power has dropped quite significantly. Um, so we're now basically not using, the, we're not harvesting enough power to power our sensor at this point. And that's sort of the one big challenge with this. Also, reliability is another big challenge because to optimize the amount of power, you want to optimize the amount of stress and the amount of displacement. Well, if you 
the higher the stress, the more likely your device is to break or fail. So it's a trade-off between, you know, trying to harvest power uh, and, and trying to make something reliable and last for a lifetime. So people have tried to increase the bandwidth, uh, but when you increase the bandwidth, you drop the, the, the peak power. So, you know, yes, this power now is better than this, but it's still not as good as up here. Uh, so we're still, so then again, power density becomes an issue. So what we're working on is trying to develop new methods of increasing the bandwidth without dropping the power, which is actually quite difficult. And we do a lot of nonlinear dynamics and stuff like that to try to accomplish this. Another method is, can we tune it? So now that our resonant frequency is here, if our vibration source is over here, can we change the resonant frequency of our cantilever device to move? To a, you know, uh, this is actually very difficult to implement. I'll talk about one brief example of how we're how we're working on this. There's other methods that we're trying, but again, I, I yeah, um, you know, since this is being uh, broadcast, I don't want to you know, I can't talk to someone more confidential. So, um, but I'll go through some of these. Of course, the ideal application is if you have a vibration source that doesn't change. Of course, if anyone can think of a vibration of a, an application where the vibration source is never going to change, um, please let me know. Uh, there's not very many applications that, that do this. Uh, but if you can, uh, this is, you know, this would be quite important because then we could easily make a device to, uh, to operate in that application. This is just showing, uh, this one was actually made for a smart building application, but this is showing, so the, the length of this is about uh, seven, eight millimeters in length. So it's actually a big MEMS device. Uh, relatively large. And the reason why it's that large is to get to the low frequency that we need. Uh, but you see our, our power dropped quite a bit, you know, from two and a half milliwatts to about one milliwatt. And that's just because now we're actually trying to apply it. We're trying to target a specific frequency. Um, and that just causes, you know, all types of problems. Uh, one of the big problems that I just, well, I mean, we've, we've worked on energy hearts for a different, bunch of different applications, but I want to target one application specific. Um, one was on leadless pacemakers. So all of you are probably familiar with pacemakers. So they typically have, you know, like this, uh, that has all the electronics, the battery, and then you have leads going into the heart. And this is usually implanted in the clavicle. Well, the latest generation of, of pacemakers is leadless pacemakers, where they implant these into the heart. And there's actually some FDA approved uh, ones already, but these FDA approved ones, they require batteries. And this is such a small capsule. Um, I'll show a size on the next slide that, you know, again, the amount of batteries that you can fit in there is very small. So again, the, the lifetime of these might not last that long. And Unlike these other ones, you can't go and take these out. They're screwed into the heart wall. You can't really go and take them out. But you ask, well, why did they ever go to the lead list? Well, the main failure mode for these is the leads. So people can play, you can feel these underneath your skin and they can play with them and they get tangled up. And so these, these cause failure. So this is a way to get around that and to, cause, uh, to not cause failure. So what we came up with was the heart is a very good mechanical pump. So if we can, Heart, and this is a vibration. So if we can actually put our uh, like a energy harvester in here, such as cantilever, then we can as this as we create a mechanical movement vibration, we can actually harvest energy from that, and we can maybe increase the lifetime of the battery. I'm not going to go through all of the results and stuff, uh, but basically we were able to get decent power, about 5.62 microwatts of power uh, from this. And this just shows the capsule with our device in there. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it needs to be about double that to, to actually be useful. Uh, but of course, there's also the lifetime, you know, would this work for, you know, 20 years or something like that? That's those kind of tests still need to be un, uh, taken up. Uh, you know, we haven't done long term reliability testing or anything like that, but we're in the order of the ballpark of where we want to get with the power anyways. Um, yeah. I'm working on different methods of increasing the bandwidth, but I see my time. So I'm actually gonna kind of skip this uh, slide for now. Uh, tunable uh, MEMS devices, I mentioned this. So one method that we used uh, to tune the, uh, the MEMS devices, we took a, we, on our cantilever, we put a new photo responsive material. So this is a material that changes its mechanical properties as you shine different lights on it. So we, as we shine UV light, if we shine green light, um, it changes its mechanical properties. And if it changes its mechanical properties, 
it's changing the stiffness of the cantilever. And if you change the stiffness, then you change the frequency. So here we showed, you know, here's our initial frequency of our cantilever. And then after we assigned it with UV uh, stimulation, uh, we were able to tune it. And again, not a lot, you know, not a large tuning, but again, and the amount of tune and the amount of tuning that we could get is, is dependent on the intensity of the light that we shine on that. Um, another area that I work on besides energy harvesting is aerosol generators. So aerosol generators um, are quite, you know, you, you can think of these as like, you know, humidifiers and stuff like that at home. Uh, but we were using them initially for drug delivery. Um, but now we're looking at using them for different techniques. The reason why we've we, we're the first people to try this in, at the MEM scale. And at the MEM scale, the reason why we're interested in developing these at MEM scale is that we can add functionality. So we can add different sensors. We can add different components to this uh, to where we can now use these in different applications, not just for drug delivery. So this just shows an example of or uh, this is like a, a saline for someone who has asthma. So this is like a butyrol uh, that's being atomized. Um, just showing that this, these things work. But now we're looking at using these in different technologies. I can't talk about all the technologies uh, due to patent issues. Um, but we, right now we are working on, like I said, inhaled drug delivery. We've shown that we can do this. We're also looking at uh, using this for advanced manufacturing. So we're actually using a MEMS device to create new MEMS devices. Um, so we use this to, to spray, for instance, photoresist into, into large topography um, uh, surfaces like as found in MEMS devices often. And we get a more conformal coating uh, when we do this versus if you do normal spin coating where all the photoresist just sits at the bottom of this trough uh, or, or channel, uh, we can get more conformal coating. Um, acoustic, yeah, okay. I see I'm almost out of time, but I'm also, I only have a couple more slides. So, um, so acoustic resonators. Um, so I mentioned these, these are what's found a lot of times in your phone as, you know, RF MEMS uh, for filtering out transmission lines and stuff. Um, what we're working on though, we're, we're working on making them for that enhancing properties, but we're also working on, can we use these same type of sensors for other applications? Uh, one is a uh, biosensor. So I'm, I'm going back to my biomedical, uh, again, back to the history that I had, uh, you know, that I did 15 years ago. Can I make these, can I use this technology that we've developed for, for smart, for smartphones and use them uh, as a biosensor? So for instance, this is how um, even some of your COVID uh, sensors, uh, some of the ones being developed by some of the companies are actually made uh, using this type of technology. Uh, some future projects, uh, you know, so uh, we work a lot with micro needles. So um, these are things that like for drug delivery. So again, there's a lot of people working on this area, um, trying to create different types of needles. Uh, these are painless needles. So these are ones that just go barely into the skin. So they don't go deep enough to hit the nerve cells. So they're painless drug delivery. So you could use these for delivering vaccines or delivering uh, glucose for people that have you know, uh, diabetes and stuff like that. Uh, other areas of interest in the future or that I'm work, currently working on is taking uh, piezoelectric materials and making new uh, microelectronics, making new ferroelectric field effect transistors. Uh, so these are instance for memory devices. Um, we're interested in using these technologies as micro thrusters for aerospace applications, uh, developing new ultra sensitive biosensors, uh, new touch screens, as I mentioned. Uh, you know, all using the same materials, uh, in a slightly different way, and even uh, micro robots. So I had a master student back a couple of years ago who was looking at trying to mimic uh, jellyfish movement using piezoelectrics, and the hope that we could, you know, implant these robots maybe in the body to deliver drugs. That's probably a little bit more far fetched. Ideally, what we were thinking is, could it be? Go, could they go through pipes? You know, liquid pipes to to fix cracks or something in the pipeline. Uh, for instance, for oil pipes or for nuclear pipes, because these can handle high temperature applications and stuff like that, or reactive radiation uh, also. So in summary, you know, so 
there's a lot of different jobs out there in the area of MEMS. The market is 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 great. So that you know, if you're interested in a job in this, the, the potential uh, you know career um, advances uh, throughout your lifetime is is quite high. Um, you can also, you know, um, like I said, if you're interested in any area in STEM, you know, I know people often ask, well, what, what you know, type of, you know, uh, discipline should I go into? Electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, are obviously the two main ones, but any, even chemical engineering, I have students in chemical engineering, I have students in math uh, department, you know, working for me. So really all these things, uh, machine learning, computational, computer, you know, um, even chemistry, even biology, you know, uh, people working in bio men. So there's a lot of different areas. And every MEMS engineer or technician has their own journey. I mean, if you talk to Dr. Plyle, if you talk to any of these other people, you know, they all have, you know, a different story of where they started and where they've gone. Uh, but you never know what's going, where the, where the journey is going to take you, um, and it can go anywhere. And I don't know what the next, you know, twenty years of my career hold. Uh, you know, we'll see. Uh, but yeah, but basically, if you're if you're interested in if you're in, if you have a strong interest to learn about new technology, new disciplines, um, you want to be very diverse. Then I would say again, MEMS is sort of and microfabrication is sort of the right field for you. And I just want to sum that up uh, with a couple quotes uh, that I like uh, that I think are relevant to MEMS. Uh, one is by Yogi Berra. So if, I don't know some of you might not know who Yogi Berra is, but you know, old baseball player. But he had all these uh, famous idiotic quotes kind of, but it says, if you don't know where you're going, you'll wind up somewhere else. And this is true of MEMS. Uh, I know early on in the MEMS career, a lot of people would make a MEMS device and they'd, be like, they'd come to me and say, then what can I do with this? I've made this device now, where, what application? And that's obviously the wrong approach. You should always be have an end application in mind whenever you're designing or developing a device. Uh, the other one is from Richard Feynman, who's sort of the founder of, of sort of microfabrication. Uh, it says, it doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is. It doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. Um, so, you know, not, not to bash theoretical people, uh, but again, uh, yeah, if you can't, if you can't prove it, if you can't experiment, if you can't make it work, uh, then, you know, then your theory can be all wrong. And of course, if you have any questions, you can always, uh, email me at injec at unm.edu and thank you. And I'll open it up for questions. Well, thanks, Nathan. That was really good. If you could um, stop sharing your screen and then we can go to gallery mode and see everybody. That would be really cool. I'm going to go to gallery mode. So um, we did have one question um, from Ozan. Um, he thanks you for sharing. And then he's, he's um, asking about the transition from industry back into academia. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I'm sure you've read the, 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 the question already in the chat box. So if you could address that. that would yes. Be so yeah, it's been a big, well, so a, I've had two challenges, a going from industry to academia, but also going from uh, European uh, to us, you know, so um, yeah, because the European funding, uh, for instance, for, for research is quite different. They're very much more applied uh, as U.S. is much more fundamental science. So it's it's definitely been a challenge there. Um, as far as transitioning from industry to academia, I, I use that to my advantage. So, um, you know, like when I teach my courses, I try to, you know, emphasize on more practical, you know, I don't do the sim I mean, you know, we have to obviously do the academic route, the, the theoretical stuff, but I try to give students, you know, here's what, you, here's what, here's the theoretical, here's what, you know, you do in academia, but here's actually what you do in, when you go and work in industry, you know, here's what they actually use, you know. Um, so I hope that that gives my students, you know, uh, an, you know, an advantage, you know, when they go and try to work uh, and get a job. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's been somewhat of a challenge, but it's, it's not that bad. Like I said, it's, it's more about going from, uh, applied, getting something to work, you know, you know, some thinking something in the industry, you want something to work in the next couple of years as academics are more, okay, I want something that's, you know, maybe going to be the next big thing in 20 years or something, you know? So, uh, so that's been sort of the, the big challenge, but I still try to work on applied and work. And I still work with a lot of companies even in mind, you know, working with small business uh, loan associations and stuff like that. So, 
Yeah, and I think that's real valuable for your students, right? Yeah, I hope so. (laughs) Most of our students end up going into industry or national labs or places like that. Um, Only a few of them end up going into academia. Yeah. And, and the stuff you learn, even the practical stuff is still useful in academia. So, I mean, it's still, you know, um, like I said, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm a person that I love learning all the time. Uh, so I, I don't think there's, you know, anything that, you know, if you learn something, there is no way that's wasted knowledge, you know, and that's one thing I want, you know, to kind of highlight, it, it, you never know, you know, like the stuff, you know, as a student, you know, you, you might think that you're the stuff you're learning in your course, you're like, I'm not going to use this, uh, but you never know. Maybe in 10 years time, you might. And that's the same thing with me. I mean, I, I was that way too, as a student, you know, and even as a, you know, like even doing my PhD, like there's stuff that I did when I was doing my PhD that I haven't now done in 15 years, but all of a sudden I'm like, Oh wait, now I'm like, now I have a problem with my current MEMS device. I'm like, Oh, can I actually use that? You know, I'm like, okay. Yeah. And, I, and now I can use that knowledge. So, you know, any knowledge is always good and, you know, Try to keep it, you know, in your head. So that way, you know, you can always go back and and use it when you need to. All right. We have some questions regarding um, um, clean room processing and that sort of thing. Um, I'm going to refer the the person asking that question to um, to the SCME um, online short courses. And I'll, I'll go ahead and put a link in there. So you can um, SCME.online. So we have a lot of information on the basics of fabrication because to talk about fabrication would be another, you know, eight hours. Um, yeah. There's a lot involved in that. So it's SCME. Yeah, somebody corrected me. Thank you. I typed my own website. <laughs> SCME. Some online. online. Um, and then you can also shoot me an email and I've got resources as well as Dr. Jackson on, on fabrication. So, yeah. Yeah. I didn't focus too much on the fabrication. Yeah. Cause I mean, it's, it's a whole nother area and yeah, it's yeah. Well, this was really good and very informative, but what's interesting is, is, you know, once you get a, a handle on some of the fabrication methods, you can make build a lot of things with it. So it's like having a box of Legos. <laughs> exactly. And that's where I, you know, like I, I mentioned the side project on the ultrasound transducer, you know, for my PhD, that was just something on this. Like neither, both me and the other, um, other PhD students that were working on that. It was not part of any of our, either of our PhDs or anything. We were, we were just in the fab and we're like, wait, we can make this, you know? And we're like, okay, let's try, you know, we just sort of like made these and then ended up, you know, you know, it's, and it's even, and now, actually, like I said, those are actually used in human, ultrasound stimulation are actually being used in humans now. Uh, you know, so the work that we did, you know, that was just sort of a side thing, um, ended up leading to, you know, stuff that's actually, I know, like a psychology professor in UNM is actually using this to, to look at cognitive, you know, functions and stuff like that, you know. So, um, so yeah, it's quite fascinating. Yeah, and Elon Musk just got into the neural implant yeah. business so yes, yes yes letting monkeys control the computer just by thinking yes yes and that's all work from again starting uh, you know like from the university of michigan A- arizona state was very big into that you know um i wasn't part of that gr- you know the initial group that but they had a paper published in science you know showing that you know a robot you know a monkey controlling a robotic limb you know and how actually the robotic limb is actually quicker um than than you know so like the monkey when he thought to grab the banana was actually quicker than than the than the actual hand uh, because again uh, electrons travel faster uh, than than the signals through our through our nerves so so it was slightly faster than to get the banana um, so you know you could yeah, be a bionic that, person or something yeah wasn't that a DARPA project to yes, try to get yes. uh, pilots to be able to fly without having to use their hands? Yep, yep, yep. yep. Fly by mind? Yep, and it's all the same thing. And there's different ones. So we were working on implantable um, electrodes, but then there was people, there's a lot of people working on like um, like ones that sit on top of your skull. Um, but I, the way that I, I envision that is almost like a stadium. Like, you know, like if the one on the skull, like the, the spatial um, resolution that you can get is very small. Like you might be able to tell, like if the whole, if the whole stadium is yelling boo or, you know, something other obscene gestures to the ref or something like that. Um, but like the implantable 
then is going to like if you can if you want to try to sense a single person what one person in that whole stadium is trying to say and that's what we were trying to do we were we were focused on trying to get a single neuron or, or a couple neurons you know and trying to focus on that fantastic so anyone else any other questions well with that i think we should all give him a round of applause yeah thank you Nice job. Micro Nano Education for everyone.